Director and Chair of the Williams College Association of Maryland. Uh, and I want to welcome you all to today's Zoom call with the doctors. Uh, about a year ago, we had the opportunity to hear from individually from Drs. Marty Wasserman, class of 64, Dr. John Fielder, class of 94, and Dr. Bo Kim, class of 92, uh, about uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, from their perspective as physicians, and specifically in the case of John and Bo uh, as a missionary physician and as an ICU physician. And so we're excited to hear from them today about what they've learned in the time since. Um, I will uh, invite you to keep yourselves muted um, during, the, uh, during the course of the call and throw any questions that you have into the chat. Uh, Marty will uh, moderate a, a discussion with uh, uh, Dr. Kim and Dr. Fielder. And then uh, at, uh, at a time in the conversation, he will throw it open and uh, I will feed him questions that have been sent uh, via the chat. So uh, I will hand it over now to Dr. Marty Wasserman, class of 64. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks. Hi, Rob, Good to see you from Williamstown. Just wanted to uh, acknowledge that it was about a year ago, I think it was April 13th, when we had this first discussion. Uh, and then I think the next two subsequent discussions were John and Bo. So we're really looking a year uh, since we had our original conversations. Let me tell you what I'd just like to do before we get into the major part of today, which I think will be um, John, who's a, a missionary in Africa, and Bo, who is an intensivist at Hopkins. And um, But what, what I'd like to do is kind of give you a public health update. And I'll start with the timeline, uh, talk about our current status in our fight against the virus, give you the good news, give you some of the current issues, and then suggest what some of our recommendations should be in order for everybody to stay safe. So back in December of 2019, we've only known this virus for 16 months. A serious respiratory viral infection was discovered in Wuhan, China. In January 9th, there were 59 cases. Let's think about that, 59 cases in January 19th, 2020. By mid-January, the virus had been sequenced, the, ge the genomic sequence of the virus in China. And subsequently at the end of the month, it was confirmed by the Pasteur Institute in France. On January 21st, we had the first case of COVID-19 discovered in the United States in, um, in Washington state. Coincidentally, it happened to be uh, worked on by a health officer in Snohomish County, uh, Washington, whom I had the pleasure of working with 25 years ago when he was just completing his uh, preventive medicine residency um, at Hopkins. So an interesting sideline. On January 21st um, or in February 23rd, we had the first death in our country. And by March 11th of 2020, just uh, 13 months ago, the World Health Organization declared a worldwide pandemic. By mid-March, the United States only had about 100 deaths, but we started to close our schools and various states had various kinds of lockdowns. By April 6, just a year ago, there were 10,000 deaths in the United States. So that's where we were when we started a year ago. Now we have 31 million cases in the United States, 560,000 deaths. And right now we're kind of going down and up with about 5,000 new hospitalizations every day. The good news is that we have three vaccines. Um, it took a year to get them started, a, a, record, a record in terms of vaccine production. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines or messenger RNA vaccines, uh, synthetic vaccines. Uh, we, we had, we've never used these before, but they seem to be 90 to 95% effective. And we have the J&J vaccine, which is currently having some issues. It's a DNA vaccine and more traditional. It's associated with an adenovirus and is, that technology has been used previously. To date, we have had about 200 million doses administered in the United States. Nearly a quarter of our population is fully vaccinated. And on Saturday, 
we gave a record number of 4.6 million uh, doses administered. That's the news on the preventive side. On the treatment side, again, a year ago, we had nothing and deaths were accumulating. We were going through uh, various waves of this, um, of this virus and deaths and with no ability to, um, to deal with it. So everyone was at risk. We now have monoclonal antibodies. You've heard of Regeneron and, a, and an additional one uh, developed by Eli Lilly. Dexamethasone has been used. Ramdesivir, you've heard about. Um, anticoagulants have been used uh, as well on patients who've been hospitalized and we'll probably hear more about the treatments from uh, Dr. Kim in a moment. And we've also been using, uh, and Dr. Kim can uh, tell us whether the this is good or bad or how it's um, how it's a, a level of effectiveness is convalescent plasma, which has an emergency use authorization from the FDA, but uh, that can be questionable its value in treatment. So the questions we have today, um, as we begin to open up our society is will we reach herd immunity? As I said, we have 25% of the population now. Dr. Fauci says we need about 70 to 85% of the population. We have a, a variety of variants um, which make the, uh, the virus, uh, it, it, it eases the transmission of the virus and there's a question as to whether or not it's more lethal. Of course, if the transmission is, is increased and more people get it, there will be more deaths as a result. We have three variants, one from, UK, from, from the UK, one from South Africa, one originating in Brazil. They all have numeric names, which it's easier, it's better to talk about uh, from, a, from a, a geographic standpoint. But uh, we, let's leave it for today's discussion to the UK Brazil and uh, South African variants. 20,000 cases in the United States of the UK variant and less than 1,000 of the other two. The speed of these mutations depend upon host availability. And that's why it's important that in order to reduce the number of variants, we increase the numbers of vaccinated and we keep people separated. And I'll mention that in, uh, in a moment. As far as the uptake of the vaccine, as, as you know, and, and we'll probably get some questions regarding the anti-vaxxer movement, where people uh, purposefully provide false information, particularly on the internet and through social media, uh, suggesting that the vaccines are dangerous and ineffective. That has created vaccine or added to vaccine hesitancy that already exists in minority populations and persons of color due to what I'll just flat out say is the structural racism that we faced in our country. Um, and that is an, an, another separate issue, but it is contributory and affects the social determinants of health and the impact disproportionately on um, and disparities in those populations. Uh, the other question is the lack of complete scientific understanding. How long is this immunity gonna last both by from the vaccine and from the natural infection? Will we have more variants of the virus and, um, and will they become vaccine resistant and will they cause more serious infections? The long-term effects of following the virus has been, um, is still up in the air. And maybe um, Dr. Kim will be able to address that uh, if he's had a chance to look into that matter. There were studies that came out of England that, that recognized perhaps 70% of hospitalized patients had a variety of, patient, of, uh, of, of symptoms that include pain, fatigue, muscle aches, mental cloudiness, breathlessness, and a variety of other symptoms as long up to five months when the study occurred after they were hospitalized. And they were so um, uh, obstructive that 20% of those patients were unable to return to work. 
So with that as the background, I've looked at the virus as saying we are now hopefully in the terminal stages of this first phase of, the, of this illness. And, and so in order to maximize the, our ability to, to tamp this down, uh, what are the recommendations uh, that we should follow as we open up our schools, we open up our religious services, Jason, as we open up businesses, as we have more engagement with our families and, um, and as we uh, open up entertainment and sports. From my perspective, uh, looking at the public health recommendations, we need to continue to wear masks. Uh, they've been very effective also this year in severely limiting um, influenza vaccine. Uh, we should maintain uh, appropriate social distancing follow the recommendations of our public health officials. They may be coming down a bit in schools. Um, hopefully uh, we'll have a good solid uh, recommendations from our public health and medical folks and also um, get vaccinated as soon as you can with whatever product is out there. They're all safe and effective and be wary of the politiciz politicization of this illness and my best advice is follow the science, the experts and the evidence. And with that, I think I'd, I'd like to turn it over to, um, to, to Dr. John Fielder, class of 94, who's been in Africa for over 20 years, running a series of missionary hospitals there. And I think you're based in, in Kenya. And then we'll go to, to Dr. Kim and get into the nuts and bolts of what it's like to to both fight the infection. And I would imagine if I were in your shoes, Bo, fear the infection as well. So let's start with John. Well, thank you, Marty. Um, I'll start by giving uh, an overview of, of how far we've come here in Kenya. And you please um, come in and ask any questions or push me in any, any direction. Uh, as you said, a year ago, I joined uh, this forum and at that time, you know, there was a lot of trepidation here about, about the virus coming to Africa because uh, it's a very medically vulnerable population, number one, and, and number two, the resources are quite limited compared uh, to what's available in the United States. Uh, it, it took a while for the first surge to, to come to Kenya. It really came toward the end of July and then through August and September. And I worked on the COVID ward of uh, one fairly well-resourced uh, mission hospital at that time. I'll circle back and talk a little bit about what that was like and what we were able to do. Uh, a second wave came in October, November, and now we're in the middle of a third surge, which has been the worst, perhaps driven by the variants that you mentioned, uh, maybe by the South African variant and its aggressiveness. Uh, so, uh, but in general, the feeling has been that we, at least relatively speaking, and I, and I stress that it's relatively speaking because the burden has been significant, but that we may have, have dodged a bullet uh, to, some, to some extent. And that one of the questions that people ask is why? Why may Africa uh, not have been hit as hard? And, and there's a couple possible explanations that people put forward. I, I think the, the two most compelling are the age structure of the population that it, you're just dealing with a much younger society. You know, about three and a half percent of Kenyans are over the age of 65. The median age is 19. Um, figures are similar across um, sub-Saharan Africa. And, and we know that this is an infection which disproportionately um, burdens and sickens uh, older adults. And then the second part, which maybe surprised, surprised us the most, is that uh, the, we knew early on in China that the comorbidities were such that people with diabetes, for example, or pre-existing heart disease were at high risk, but and we kind of transferred that um, assumption uh, to some of the diseases we see here, like HIV and either concurrent or previous tuberculosis. And, and there is some data, including data from South Africa, that, that, that those two conditions do increase your risk of uh, of uh, fatality with COVID, but 
that probably not as much as we had feared and that really diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart failure, uh, chronic kidney disease, those kinds of chronic metabolic and non-communicable diseases may carry a much higher uh, uh, infection fatality risk. Um, in fact, if you look at South Africa, which has been the hardest hit in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is a little bit older, it's median age is 27, but it also is a country that, that has a lot of those non-communicable diseases in addition to HIV and, and tuberculosis and, and some of those um, other infectious diseases that we associate with this setting. So um, these two explanations may account for some of, of why uh, Africa has not been hit as hard as we thought it was going to be. Now, I, I read an article from Zambia that was interesting. Um, in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, it's unlike here in Kenya. If you're going to get a death certificate, the body has to basically go through the main teaching hospital. And so researchers there use that fact um, post-mortem to test people within 48 hours of death for COVID. And they found a really surprising amount of COVID in people who had died either at a, a smaller health facility, outlying health facility, or in the community. And, and the, the authors conclude that it, it wasn't that Africa dodged a bullet, it's just that we're not testing enough and we're missing it. I ran that by some of my colleagues here and they said, you know, that that's not what anyone has really seen in, in smaller health facilities, for example, in Kenya. Um, they're not getting reports of a lot of pneumonia, a lot of people showing up at clinics or smaller hospitals. Uh, I mean, certainly it is happening. Like I said, we're in the middle of a surge and it is straining limited resources, particularly oxygen. But um, e even in that Zambia study, it was surprising the number of children who, who had passed away and tested positive for COVID. Uh, part of that, uh, I think, is probably more related to um, dying uh, with rather than of uh, COVID. And, and that's because when uh, what we found here in Kenya, a group of epidemiologists found that uh, by late July, early August, about a third of people in Nairobi and Mombasa had already had the infection. It had really torn through these crowded cities, which is what you would expect. And so therefore, if someone does die of something else, you might find COVID. Um, and it, it may have been a contributing factor, but for example, in that study from Zambia, uh, it, the number one uh, comorbid condition that people had was tuberculosis, which really raises the question, were they dying of COVID? Were they dying of tuberculosis? Was there some synergistic um, effect of, of each of them? So, um, like I said, I worked on the COVID ward at uh, a hospital called Kijabi Hospital, which is a very old, 105-year-old uh, hospital that's about 70 kilometers outside of Nairobi, and certainly a better resource hospital for this setting. Um, an ICU, um, where, where I used to work many years ago, um, it's well-trained staff, um, more oxygen than most places. And, and that was in August and September, we, at the height of the surge, we just came up to the point where we were um, potentially having to turn people away uh, because of, of a lack of oxygen and, and had, you know, at any one time, a peak of 20 to 24 patients in the hospital with COVID. And, you know, those numbers, again, are pretty small compared to what's being reported in, in, in what people like Dr. Kim are experiencing uh, across uh, many hospitals in the United States. Uh, so we followed, um, uh, well, there was an, a wing of the hospital, the pediatric wing of the hospital was given over to become a COVID ward. And it was well set up for that um, in a way that uh, it could be um, sectioned off from the rest of the hospital and uh, could be, um, patients could be isolated uh, or at least cohorted by their, their risk for COVID. And um, we, we protocolized, uh, things were protocolized there in the sense that um, patients got kind of a cocktail when they came in and were a COVID suspect. And I can summarize it by A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, so A was azithromycin. And, you know, the, the reason we used that was not because of some of this uh, early um, and, and, you know, subsequently really um, debunked data from France that azithromycin might be helpful. 
Uh, it was more because um, working with junior doctors and physician assistants, we wanted everything to, to be protocolized so that you would cover bacterial pneumonia and atypical bacterial pneumonia. So the second uh, for, for B was breathing, that was supplemental oxygen. Uh, C was for ceftriaxone, another antibiotic. Um, D was for dexamethasone, which you mentioned uh, because um, of the clinical trials showing that, that that can save lives and it is available here and cheap and, and something we can use. Although a lot of the patients who came in had diabetes, either new or established diabetes. So when you give them steroids, their sugar really goes out of control. E was for the blood thinner and oxaparin, uh, which again, th that's how this hospital was different. It's better resourced. Many, many places don't have a steady supply of an oxaparin uh, or any other kind of um, uh, injectable blood thinner like heparin. They may not even have that and patients may not be able to afford it. And then F was face down or proning, meaning uh, there's some utility in putting patients on their stomach and uh, helping with redistribution of uh, blood flow in the lungs. So uh, all the patients got that, that cocktail. Some patients uh, progressed from the regular COVID ward into either what's called here a high dependency unit, which is kind of like a progressive care unit in the United States or an in intermediate care unit or on into the ICU. I think the hospital has only uh, intubated and ventilated three patients at the last I heard. Uh, I only did it once and, and all those patients passed away. So here, uh, ventilators are just really not the answer. We don't have a lot of them. Uh, the infection control issues are significant. And, you know, as uh, you know, Dr. Kim can speak with more specificity, but we know that even in very um, high resource settings that, that outcomes with ventilation are, um, are not always optimal. So um, that, that was really used rather sparingly. And there were certain criteria for who could be who could be intubated, um, you know, if, if they had uh, prognostic factors that um, were very poor, then, you know, the protocol said that they would not be intubated because the burden on the hospital, the personnel burden and the financial burden uh, were, were significant. Um, I'll finish by uh, uh, saying two things uh, about systems. Um, number one is uh, the hospital where I worked on the COVID ward uh, as I mentioned, years ago, I helped set up the ICU there, and, and you could really see the, the years and, in fact, decades of investment that, that went into intensive care. So they had physician assistants who were formally trained with certificates in intensive care, what's called a higher diploma here. Uh, they had uh, faculty members uh, who had experience in intensive care. There were protocols. There were nurses. There's an ICU nurse training program. Uh, formal program at the nursing school at that hospital. So you could really see the impact of those years of investment. And, and then allied with that is oxygen. You know, the answer isn't ventilators here, it's oxygen, but it's in such a uh, short supply. And, you know, Kenya is better off than many African countries like Malawi, where I used to work. Uh, things were really bad for a while. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, creating systems that can produce oxygen either for a hospital or to produce cylinders for distribution. It's expensive. Um, it it uh, requires a lot of upfront capital. Then it requires systems to continue and maintain that capital. Uh, and we're, our organization is in the process now of uh, putting in two such systems, one in Kenya and one in Malawi, to both serve uh, hospitals, but also uh, to produce cylinders for distribution. And, and we hope to be able to do more of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and the great thing about doing that is that there, there's all kinds of other diseases, of course. I mean, even before COVID came, we did not have enough oxygen. So I'll finish um, with just saying, you know, I gave the experience in a, in a better resource hospital where I do most of my clinical work is aware for, uh, away from where I live. It's north of Mount Kenya. It's a much less resourced hospital. It's um, in, a, in a poor area, in a more rural area, and it has much less oxygen, although it does have some. And, and it's also in an area with, with quite a bit more stigma uh, about, the, about the disease. So um, my experience working there with patients with COVID is, is much different. Like even bringing up the issue of testing someone 
people start looking around the room, the junior doctors start looking around the room and saying, um, yeah, it's really difficult with this patient to bring up the issue of testing and we don't have enough isolation space. And so um, the, the fact is, is outside of a few centers with resources, uh, as you go out away from a few, you know, really well-resourced hospitals or urban areas, you really run into serious, uh, per, you know, resource constraints. Um, so I will, I'll finish there, answer any questions you have or pass it over to Dr. Kim. Maybe just let me ask one quick question. And that's, um, you, you talked about the hesitancy with regard to, um, with regard to testing, but you didn't mention anything about vaccine. Are there vaccines mm -hmm. and to what extent are they available? And to what extent, if they were available, would they be utilized? Yeah, Marty, thanks for bringing that up. I should have mentioned that. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine came here um, close to a month ago. I, that's when I got my first shot. Um, in a month, uh, Kenya uh, immunized about 280,000 people. Uh, that was well behind the government's targets. I think it has, I, I might be wrong about, I think the first tranche had about 1.2 million and whether they received any more or not, I don't know. They first focused on frontline health workers and then also, um, then they expanded it to anyone over the age of, of 58. And um, they're, they're, you know, I, I, I had written and shopped around an article about the difference in vaccine hesitancy between, between Africa and, and the United States. I'll tell a story about, I was in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, I think this was about 2015, and there was a measles outbreak at that time uh, because of the war in the Duma Mountains, uh, all the vaccines for kids have been interrupted. And this one Catholic hospital had gotten a, a bunch of vaccines and was out in the community immunizing everyone. And people would just come en masse. I mean, it just a huge number of people would come to, to, to get their kids vaccinated. And that's been my experience. I had never run across vaccine hesitancy, but vaccine hesitancy uh, our vaccines here are, are mostly for, for kids, you know, for newborns and for infants. And, and so we have seen, and um, some of my Kenyan friends have brought up this concern about, um, you know, spreading suspicion and, and, and vaccine hesitancy um, in, in, in Kenya. And so when I told the executive director of Kijabi Hospital that I was going to get a vaccine, he said, please get a picture of you getting the vaccine and so that we can share it among the staff. And, and so I shared it with both of the hospitals and I'm, I'm happy to say that, that uh, the, the hospital um, where I usually go, Moa Methodist, that apparently the uptake has been quite brisk, um, but, but there is um, at least rumors of a surprising amount of vaccine hesitancy. I should say, and I'll finish with this, is that uh, Rwanda, uh, they, they immunized almost a quarter of a million people in a week. So, so there are places where the rollout is, is quite brisk. Well, one thing is that tr trusted member of society, when you get the vaccine, show it that's what uh, the recommendations are in our country as well. Well, Bo, I guess we're gonna, we're gonna call on you. We're looking forward to hearing what it's like. Sort of John and I talked a little bit more about uh, some of the, the, the stable factors and what's going on in a variety of countries, but take us right into the intensive care unit and what that looks like. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me back, Jason, and happy to uh, join the discussion. Uh, John and Marty, please direct me uh, in any direction that you see fit I, uh, if I go off topic. Um, I'm just in, a uh, in contrast to what John was saying, uh, I'm in a resource rich environment and I work in a unit where we take care of patients on ECMO. Uh, ECMO is, stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. That's a device that basically can act as an artificial lung. Uh, it pumps blood out of the patient, oxygenates it, and then pumps it back into the patient. And it basically is designed for uh, those patients who fail standard mechanical ventilation. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to practice with, with uh, oxygen being uh, so limited when uh, I'm, I'm used to this environment where we have 
uh, all the protective equipment that uh, at our disposal and all the uh, medical technology and interventions that are at our disposal. Uh, so just to give you kind of my experience with COVID specifically, so we got our first PUI, patient under investigation, uh, at the end of February uh, of last year. And we put this patient under isolation and everyone was terrified. We just didn't know what to expect from this virus. We, this was a new disease. You know, we, we were thinking Ebola uh, as, a, as a kind of a high mortality uh, infection. And so, we were really stressed out just to go into this room. Turned out the patient did not have COVID. And in fact, we uh, ended up admitting uh, three patients uh, by the second week of March. And these patients ended up being in what we call a biocontainment unit. So just to, again, give you a stark contrast of, of what it's like here at Hopkins where everything is subspecialized, where we are resource rich. Uh, we have a unit for basically every subspecialty you can imagine. So cardiology has a cardiac uh, intensive care unit, medical intensive care unit for respiratory failure, neuro intensive care unit, and then a number of post-surgical uh, surgical ICUs. And during the time we had the three COVID patients, every ICU was being converted to negative pressure uh, air circulation so that <clears throat> air in the, each of these rooms would be sucked out of the hallways and uh, normal, normally uh, ICUs are kept at positive pressure. And so all of these ICUs were being converted. And uh, before you knew it, every ICU was being full, uh, filled with uh, COVID positive patients. And every uh, physician from you know, plastic surgeons to ophthalmologists, uh, they were all being asked to help care for COVID patients. So it was an incredible movement uh, you know, throughout the hospital, incredible amount of energy and resources just dedicated to taking care of COVID. And we didn't exactly know how bad it was going to get, but I'll tell you in Baltimore, we're certainly not New York City and some of the cities in, in uh, some of the hardest hit cities uh, in the West Coast, but every ICU bed was filled uh, in multiple hospitals in, in Baltimore. And we were actively converting uh, more and more ICUs. And in fact, uh, at its height, at its worst, we had converted our pediatric ICU to accept adult patients. And pediatricians were taking care of adult patients. Uh, so uh, from there, you know, it eventually died down that during that first surge. Uh, you know, the, the community support that we got was incredible. We were given free lunches every other week. Um, the, we were written letters, we were, there were drive-bys with cars honking. Uh, it was not to say that pandemics are exciting, but to be working in, in the front lines in an ICU where you're taking care of very sick patients and learning about a new disease, yes, there, there is excitement there. And there was uh, this kind of incredible motivation uh, to really try to beat the, beat the virus and beat this new disease. Now, when the first uh, surge was starting to recede, hospitals like to stay at capacity. And so they were converting many of these ICUs back to normal pressure, uh, non-bio mode. And so the, the beds available to COVID patients, uh, again, became very scarce. Uh, and so by the time, you know, the fall of last year, when the second surge, surge started to happen, uh, you know, we no longer had this incredible motivation. Uh, everyone seemed to have COVID fatigue by then. Uh, and so it was a very different attitude toward um, the second surge. And uh, even though we were again converting many of the ICUs, it seemed like at least the second surge, the patients, we didn't have as many critical care patients. And so the hospital never really filled up. And so not every, every ICU had to be converted. Now we're still in the end of the second surge. And since I take care of really the end stage of COVID disease, uh, the ones that fail mechanical ventilation, I will tell you that, of course, we've learned an incredible amount of, about COVID, about uh, the respiratory failure that results from COVID. And we also even have somewhat 
uh, long-term data, you know, really just within a year of taking care of patients and about some of the long-term sequelae, some of the uh, adverse events or adverse effects of being infected uh, that uh, Dr. Wasserman just <clears throat> that mentioned in the beginning where some patients do have a, a lot of residual effects from, from their disease. So <clears throat> I will say that in the first surge, when we were seeing these end-stage uh, lung disease patients, they were predominantly male. They were predominantly Afri African-American or, or Hispanic. Uh, we thought that we could explain away some of those, uh, some of those demographic differences by a lot of these patients had to continue working. They were, un they were in much uh, poor uh, socioeconomic classes. Uh, they were living in tighter communities. And so we thought maybe these were the explanation as to why we were seeing uh, at the end stages of disease, uh, primarily these minority groups. But that has persisted uh, through the second surge and, and we're not really at the third surge here yet, but uh, you know, the number of calls that we're getting suggests that the, the numbers are going back up. Um, the, the other thing that we've noticed in the second surge, the uh, number of women that are affected has gone up, at least in the critical care, uh, critically ill patients. And uh, we're also seeing a little bit more Caucasian patients in the critical care in the end stage disease. Now, uh, as, a, as a personal experience, I'll say that when we place patients on the ECMO machine, we are expecting a really long, uh, long term support, a really long critical course. Uh, on average, they were gonna re require during the first surge, 30 days of ECMO support. And, and usually if they were going to recover their lungs, uh, it was going to happen within those 30 days. And so uh, during that first surge, our survival on ECMO, which uh, was a surprising 60%, considering that we were using uh, this technology really as salvage therapy, really as patients failed every other intervention. Uh, and so a 60% survival uh, was incredibly uh, positive. And we, and we viewed that as, as a great success. Now, when the second surge hit, I'll tell you the second surge patients were a bit different. What I mean by that is uh, by the second surge, remdesivir and dexamethasone became standard of care. For anyone who needed oxygen, the, the patients were placed on both of these medications. Now, the use of convalescent plasma really hasn't become as popular. The data behind convalescent plasma is a little bit more controversial and not as convincing. Um, there's other medications like toclizumab, which is an anti-IL-6, meaning that it's really there to prevent the uh, robust inflammatory response to the virus that the, the body can mount. Uh, that only recently has shown some positive data in a recent uh, article. So, but, but that has not, that has really been used very sporadically. So most of the patients that we are seeing now uh, are on remdesivir and dexamethasone. Now, it's unclear whether uh, that played a positive, I, I think for the most part, it did play a positive role since we are seeing less critically ill patients, but the ones that have gone, become critically ill and, and, and ended up in our unit on, on ECMO support, it seems like it really just delayed their clinical deterioration. So they, they now present with a one to two week period of stability and, and then a rapid decline and they're no longer even uh, able to be supported with a mechanical ventilator. And, and once placed on ECMO, these patients seem to really not respond uh, as quickly as they did in the first surge. And by quickly, I meant 30 days. And so I will share with you uh, one case that uh, really um, is, uh, is, is memorable for everyone involved. So we had this young lady, she was 44 years old, and she uh, ended up with a COVID infection. She was turned away because she was too well from an outside hospital. Uh, eventually, she came back to the hospital multiple times because she felt uh, unwell, even though her vitals were not that uh, significantly low. So eventually, they did admit her, and she became uh, increasingly sick. Again, she had a, about a week-long period of stability, 
And then she was intubated, uh, placed on a mechanical ventilator, and within two days was on 100% with high amounts of pressure required to keep her lungs open. So she was transferred to us and we placed her on the ECMO support device. Uh, she didn't do anything as far as lung recovery for the first 45 days. During that time, we were organizing family discussions to, to say, we don't think this is working. We would have seen some signs of recovery by now. And of course the family wanted to stay aggressive. She's, she was very young. Uh, they didn't want to lose hope. And we've, we were setting up more and more meetings to say, okay, uh, it may be time to stop. But at day 50, there were some small signs of recovery. And so we kind of changed our tune a little bit and said, okay, let's give her a little more time and see what happens. She was actually able to be weaned off ECMO by day 68. And within the next several weeks, she was able to come off the mechanical ventilator. And then in, in two months, she was actually able to go to rehab and then eventually go home. Uh, I mean, it was an incredible save and an incredible effort by many, many people, but it really taught us uh, a really humbling lesson of, of something new about this disease and the second surge. We, we really don't know how much time it will take for certain patients to recover. Uh, we do know that approximately half the patients that are placed on this uh, salvage mode, this ECMO, do survive, but how long it takes for them to survive is a real question mark. And so we wrestle with this question uh, even to this day. Wh when do we reach futility of care in this really resource, uh, resource intense technology? And when should we ever stop uh, providing this, uh, this resource? Um, and so uh, I'll open up to questions, uh, happy to further this discussion, but uh, I will end there. Thanks, Bo. And um, just to let people know, Bo, as, as you can probably imagine, is an outstanding physician and was recognized by the Hopkins Hospital as outstanding physician of the year. So congratulations, Bo. Thank you. Thank a you lot of work. Um, I, I, just a quick couple of questions first before others get in. Uh, you did, I don't think you mentioned monoclonal antibodies. Is that part of the Hopkins protocol? No, it's not typical. Uh, I mean, tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody. Um, there are other uh, similar uh, agents, but there's, none of them are standard of care. Okay. And um, while you were dealing with this family of the 44-year-old woman, what's it like trying to get families involved when they can't come and visit? We've heard a lot about this social isolation. Yeah. How, did, how did that work for the, for the families that you've cared for and the individuals? So um, first surge again, I think we were really strict about isolation. So there were absolutely no families allowed to visit. Uh, we did talk to families every day, which was somewhat helpful, but still um, patients in isolation, certainly not helpful for the, for the patient. We started Zooming with family members, whether the patient was uh, sedated or awake, most of the patients were not awake. Uh, we still allowed families to Zoom and, and communicate with the patient and have some familiar voices uh, surrounding the patient. And, and we were thinking that that could be helpful. And then the hospital came up with a policy that after 21 days, after really 14 days, they were no longer uh, able to transmit the virus. And so after 21 days, they were able to come out of isolation. And during the second surge, we were also allowing a lot more visitations. Of course, everyone had to get uh, permission, but family members started to visit uh, little by little here, uh, you know, on patients who were out of isolation. So <clears throat> that, that was really helpful, not only for, I think the patients, uh, benefit, but also family members to really understand how sick their loved ones were and what kind of life support devices were being used to keep them alive. Uh, and so it, it does make for our discussions about how things are going and uh, how sick they are, it makes things a lot easier for them to understand. And maybe just as a final question to both you and John, what, what is the protective equipment uh, like that you where when you're seeing patients 
in both your facility and John in yours? So <clears throat> again, in a resource rich environment, we have a paper hood, a hood that surrounds my neck and head uh, with a clear um, you know, front covering that I can see out of. Um, it's, and it's attached to a, a, a pump that pumps air so that it's always positive air coming through the pump that has a filter and the air just escapes uh, out on the lower portion of where my neck is. But then I wear another gown and then I double glove on, in these patient rooms. And during the, the height of the surge, we had hired people to sit outside every ICU room to make sure that we put the equipment on properly. Did you feel comfortable enough or were you still nervous? So after the first month, you know, um, we were all pretty comfortable because we realized that we were actually protected and, and the transmission to healthcare providers, at least in our environment, was, was extremely low. John, in a, in a different environment, a resource less rich environment, but as still as dangerous a virus, what, uh, what kind of precautions and protections did you have? Yeah, er early on, it was um, a source of a lot of anxiety. Um, there were N95 masks that, that were available in Nairobi of, uh, let me say, uncertain quality or provenance. Um, we, as an organization, we were very fortunate. We, uh, our, some of our supporters stepped forward and allowed us to buy for a number of our hospital partners. Uh, even outside of Kenya, we shipped some. Uh, personal protective equipment, but the N95 masks were, were really expensive. Um, I, I was fortunate that I, I had some good N95 masks that I've been using. We do reuse them. The way that I would reuse them is I, I'd use one and and I, that would be my one for the whole day. And then I would, I would come home and, and my wife would make sure that I I stripped and got all my clothes off and then went straight to the shower. But that N95 mask would, would go into a brown paper bag and sit for basically 48 to 72 hours. And I'd cycle through two others because the virus just doesn't live that long. I mean, I mean, there are other protocols that people have for sterilizing the mask, but they tend to degrade the filter efficacy. So we just put them in bags. Um, then we had um, gowns, gloves. We had face shields. My son and his classmates and teachers uh, made about a thousand face shields just with some foam and pieces of plastic. And, and those were really helpful. You know, one of the big differences between hospitals here and in the US is, is that uh, here things are not hermetically sealed. You know, there's no air conditioning. So there tend to be a lot of windows. Uh, the, the, the rooms where patients were cohorted by risk, either certain COVID or high risk COVID or low risk COVID, those are common rooms. You know, we don't have a, a lot of individual rooms and certainly not enough isolation rooms for this volume of patients. So um, where, believe it or not, even though we're very close to the equator, it can become quite cool here. So I would walk into a room and all the windows would be closed and you'd want to open and the patients say it's too cold. <laughs> I said, we need to open these windows. But uh, where I worked at uh, this other hospital north of Mount Kenya, uh, there's really good cross breeze in the room. And, and you know, you, you feel like there's, I mean, there is, there's good ventilation because things are not, are not air conditioned. Um, maybe I could uh, pick up on something that uh, Bo said that I should have also mentioned that something similar happened here in terms of the rotation of the rooms. I mentioned that this whole wing of the hospital had been given over to a COVID ward. And after the first, actually, maybe after the second surge calmed down, they really wanted to get back to putting kids in there because it is a major, major pediatric referral hospital for pediatric surgery and all kinds of things. And, and so they moved the COVID ward over to a smaller area and then, you know, that just wasn't an, enough. So they do have to turn away patients now. And, and there's not a lot of places for those patients to go. I mean, they probably have a quarter of the uh, bed capacity that they, that they had before um, because they, they rotated like that. And, you know, that issue of uh, impacting other areas of the hospital 
there's a lot of debate about whether that impact of COVID will be worse in Africa than the direct impact of COVID. Um, uh, the Gates Foundation has put out this graph showing how far it set back certain basic indicators like um, DTP vaccination. Um, you know, we, we see tetanus here. Um, so you're at risk for a lot of kids not getting their tetanus vaccines. Uh, tuberculosis, uh, I, was, I was really surprised how few patients with TB I saw. I mean, it's just hyper endemic here. And that means a lot of people are not coming to the hospital to get that care. And then surgery, it really messed things up uh, because we would have to wait whenever a patient had any respiratory symptoms, we would have to wait and rule them out with a negative PCR that had to be sent to Nairobi for the, the COVID test, the PCR test. And, and then you'd wait and sometimes you'd wait a week and the patient you know, uh, really needed surgery. Now, if it was truly, truly emergent, they would do it, but boy, we were really walking the line there with the kinds of patients who were getting their surgeries delayed. I have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, I, I, know, I noticed, John, that you had AstraZeneca vaccine. A couple of people have, have asked about its possibilities coming into the United States. I think it's had, there have been some clotting issues. Um, I think they're questionable in terms of its efficacy. So have you studied it more than others? Have any, any comments uh, yeah. about AstraZeneca? You, you know, I saw I saw that uh, my my Sage F classmate Amy Radel, the journalist, uh, asked that question. Of course, she gave me the hard question when I when I would have liked the softball uh, friend question. But <laughs> you know, it's a it, it's it, it's a hard question. Um, I, I'm intending to get my my second AstraZeneca shot. Uh, I think obviously there is a concern around the clotting. That uh, for those who don't know, we're, we're the blood clotting that's being um, seen is, is not simply a blood clot in the leg or a blood clot in the lung, which we can see with lots of different conditions and is kind of what we think about as the traditional blood clot. These are blood clots that occur in a large vein in the brain and, and in a large vein in the spleen. And uh, a group of German researchers, there are just a couple of articles in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this week, but uh, they worked out the mechanism and it's similar to something we see with another medication. And so it is a real issue how common it is, I think, you know, is still to be sorted out and um, different countries that, that are using the AstraZeneca vaccine. I mean, in Europe, uh, Australia are um, uh, taking a different tack about how, how to deal with it. It does appear that it's more common in women and more common in younger people. So. In, in some of the countries, they've, they've changed those guidelines. Kenya has not changed the guidelines yet. I, I don't know what other options they, they would have right now. So it is an open question, but it is a, a concern. It's, there's a safety concern. There's also an efficacy concern because the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, does appear to not be nearly as effective or maybe not as effective as, at all when it comes to mild and moderate disease for the South African mutation. And, and so that is driving some of what we're seeing here in Kenya now. And, and there's, there's some reason to believe that it will protect against more severe disease caused by the South African variant, but you have both now safety and efficacy concerns. And so I, I think these countries are gonna be looking for other options. Well, not a bad response for somebody who uh, wasn't sure he wanted to field that question. <laughs> Bo, you want to try and add anything to that? Because I sure don't want to. No, I, I have nothing else to add. I, I have to say that uh, sometimes we hear news stories and they're kind of sensationalized. Uh, certainly people are very concerned about safety of vaccines or any other medications, but uh, you do have to wait for the actual trials and uh, the scientific journals to, to, to report on these things uh, to validate it. So I, I haven't really actually gone around to, gotten around to uh, looking at the, the more recent trials that uh, John had mentioned. What, what vaccine have you had? Uh, I've had the uh, Pfizer vaccine. And I had Moderna. I would just, just ask all three of us. I had a wicked second uh, injection side effects, set of side effects. How about you all? I just had a sore arm. I was I was lucky. I didn't have uh, much in the way of symptoms. John and, and I and I had a sore arm. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm coming up on, on 50, so I'm entering a new risk category for COVID and I am a healthcare worker. So I'm, I, right now I fully intend to get my second AstraZeneca shot. Very good. And there was a, a, a question that came in of whether, uh, Dr. Kim, whether you've seen any patients who've had, um, who previously had COVID um, or who've gotten COVID after they've been vaccinated. We've seen some, and as we know, uh, if you have 90, 95% efficacy, it would not be unusual. Have you seen any, or either of you? So we've seen, we have a couple of patients in the hospital that are lung, not lung transplant, but transplant patients that are immunosuppressed. They received the vaccine, um, but they still got COVID uh, infection. So they may just not have had uh, the opportunity with their suppressive medications uh, to mount an actual immunity. Uh, we have had, even in one of our ECMO patients, a uh, patient with a second infection of COVID, but I have yet to see anyone who's been immunized and, and has gotten really sick. John, any? Well, here again, you know, the rollout is so early and, and you know, I don't think anyone here has gotten their second shot, so no one would be deemed fully immunized yet. And there was a, a question about um, an Israeli study that indicated a decreased efficacy of Pfizer. Um, anybody have any thoughts about, about that? I was not aware of that. The Pfizer I think is pretty you good. Mean against this, uh, potentially against the variants or against the South African variant. I guess that's what the, however you yeah. take the question. Well, the, what's the neutralizing antibody levels are decreased um, with, I think, with all the vaccines against the South African variant. But uh, studies have varied the ones that I have seen. But um, I, I, one respected immunologist at the University of Texas Medical Branch, where I'm an adjunct uh, assistant professor, uh, he's he's an expert in this field and believes that um, at least what they're seeing in the test tube is. Uh, the, the reductions in the antibody levels uh, are probably uh, not enough to negate the protection, at least with the mRNA vaccines. But uh, again, with the AstraZeneca, that's an actual clinical trial uh, from, from South Africa that was done in young people. It was kind of a, a, a different study that they, for some reason, they did in very young people. And they found that the AstraZeneca vaccine once the, once the South African variant became predominant and, and overwhelming in South Africa, uh, the, the level of protection from the AstraZeneca vaccine for mild and moderate disease was only 10%. Good. Wow. Well, listen, I didn't, wasn't aware that the hour has, uh, has gotten away from us. Bo and John, your comments have been phenomenal. It's uh, I hope we don't have to do this again in a year. I hope that uh, we have reached terminal stages and that we keep this vaccine or this disease under control. And um, thank you both so much for participating. Um, and, thank um, you, Marty, for, uh, for moderating our discussion. Thank you, Bo and John, for, for uh, the work that you're doing. Um, I'm, uh, I continue to be uh, uh, excited about the idea that uh, someday some Williams student is going to uh, happen upon these archived videos that Rob and his team uh, are, are stashing away and uh, will write a good thesis on uh, Williams alumni responding uh, in the wake of COVID. We had a great discussion last month with Melissa, uh, Melissa Osborne Groves, class of 93, on uh, disparate educational outcomes for college students in the wake of COVID uh, with, uh, with respect to uh, different uh, modes of, of learning. Uh, next month, we'll be hearing from Raph Donaldson, class of 09, uh, who's going to talk about uh, disparities in uh, policing and uh, would uh, encourage any of you who are not in the Williams College Association of Maryland who want to make sure you get included on those invite lists, uh, drop me an email. I'll make sure you get copied in. But uh, thank you again, uh, doctors. Thank you, Rob, for connecting us. And thank all of you for participating in today's call. Hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, John and Marty. It's 